Uh, if you are in Sparwood, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Sean, one of the pastors here at Mountainside. We're, we're one church that meets in two locations, and so occasionally you'll, you'll uh, see me up on the screen. I hope you're having a good morning. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room and in Sparwood has heard of the Ten Commandments, and you could probably even quote some of them to me. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie. Now, whether you identify as a Christian or not, um, I think most of us would agree that most of the Ten Commandments make sense. They're, they're, they're pretty wise. Don't steal. That's a wise command. I can see how our community will be better if we're not constantly trying to rip each other off. Don't make anything other than me God. You don't have to be Dr. Phil to know that if you make money your God or you make your spouse your God, it's going to go really bad for you in time. So that makes sense. I can see why God is concerned about those things. There's this kind of baseline rationale <laughs> to some of the commands that just, they're just wise. Uh, except for one of them. There's one command that seems strange to me that God would be concerned about it. And, and surprising to me that he'd be concerned enough to put it on his top ten list. And it's this one. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you'll work, and on the seventh you won't. Not only will you not work, but your sons and daughters will not work. Nor will your servants, nor will your animals. No one will work. For God created for six days, and on the seventh he rested. So God says to his people, this is my decree, right? Don't kill, don't sleep with your neighbor's spouse, worship me not idols, and take a day off. Right? It's like one of these things just doesn't belong here, it just doesn't seem to fit with the rest. I mean, I don't mean to be irreverent, but if we were to kind of put our heads together, I'm pretty sure we can come up with some stuff that we think should be higher on that list than take a day off. Like, thou shalt use your turn signal when driving. That would be a really, really good one for people to actually start. Thou shalt not wear a man bun. Ever. Like, that makes sense to me. That one just seems wise. Don't eat vegan bacon. That works on two different levels. That one, especially even if you're Jewish, it still works. Um, there's lots of wise prescriptions that we can kind of put our heads together that on the surface, initially, seem like they should be higher up on the top ten list than take a day off. But God puts that on his top ten list, which tells me that him and I are out of sync on this one. And I think I know why. I think there's kind of two culprits in my life that has kind of lowered that down the list. One is the Pharisees that I read about in the New Testament, and the second is growing up my friend's mom. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a minute. But the first problem that I have when it comes to the Sabbath is that when I think of Sabbath, I initially think of, you know, a day that is the height of re ridiculous religiosity. You may know that the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day, they vigorously wanted everybody to obey the Sabbath. In fact, there were some rabbis who said that the, the, the day that everyone in Israel obeyed the Sabbath perfectly, the Messiah would come. And so this was a really, really big deal to them. And so they drafted 39 categories of activities that they regulated that had all this stuff that you weren't allowed to do to make sure you didn't even come close to accidentally encroaching on the Sabbath and doing work. Some of them are kind of ridiculous. Like I remember <laughs> I was in Israel uh, a few years back and I was getting on an elevator in Israel on the Sabbath and I didn't know that... On the Sabbath in Israel, every elevator in the country is programmed to stop at every floor and stay open the full, like the close the door button doesn't work. And I was on the 11th flipping floor and I had to, because touching, pushing a button for the elevator would be considered work. It would be a violation of the Sabbath. And I remember on this long, slow elevator ride down for the bus that I was late for, I remember thinking that if God was delighting in this slow elevator ride on the Sabbath, it wasn't because this was holy. It's because he was chuckling at me frantically pushing the closed button at every single floor. <clears throat> floor 10. Come on, come on, come on. Floor 9. Come on. It's just like over and over again. 
So the Pharisees had this kind of height of ridiculous religious expression to try to protect the Sabbath that actually start to define the Sabbath. The Sabbath would take on the shape, not for what God intended to it, but for these ridiculous regulations that they intended for it. That was the first problem I had with the Sabbath. The second was my childhood friend's mom. Uh, his family were churchgoers, mine were not. I'd often go over to his house, knock on the door, invite him to come play street hockey, or go ride a bike or something, and she'd, she'd yell at him when he'd ask for permission. She'd yell, no, it's a Sabbath. And then he'd say, well, can I at least go over to Sean's house? And she was like, no, it's our day of rest. You will sit in the corner and think holy thoughts because this is a day that the Lord has made and you will rejoice and be glad in it. And so I remember as a kid thinking that Sabbath was just subjecting half of your weekend to um, boring drudgery in Jesus' name. And I'm like, no thanks, I don't want any of that. And so I dismissed this whole idea of Sabbath for years. And if I were to lay out for you a top 10 list of things that you should lean into to really encourage fullness of life and joy as you pursue Jesus, Sabbath would not have been on that list. But that's changed. In fact, I think Sabbath, as God intended it, and that's the important proviso, as God intended it, not the ridiculous religious restrictions that define Jewish culture and Jesus' name, nor the boring wet blanket that fundamentalist parents from a generation ago would like subject their family to. I mean the Sabbath as the Lord intended for you might just be the gift that you need to get you to the life that you want. I don't need to tell you that life is hectic. But there's a franticness that defines so many of our lives. Um, I know that's true of you because when I ask you how you're doing, you know what? By far the most common answer I get, how are you doing? Busy, busy, good busy, good busy. All of us feel that way. Most people I know are, they feel that like they're overloaded, they feel taxed, they feel like they're redlining life, trying to balance work and kids and finances and schedules and exercises and church and everybody feels stressed out and everybody feels pushed to the max. That is the ride that we're all on. It reminds me of the time when the carnival came to my town when I was 10 or 11. You know, they set up in the arena parking lot, the blinking lights, the bumper cars, that whole thing. And the centerpiece, the main attraction for the carnival was this one ride called the spin -a blaster or the zip -a whirl or something like that. And my friends all wanted to ride it and I was like, man, no thanks. I don't think a human being was meant to spin that fast. I think I'll take a pass, but they were persistent. They're like, come on, it'll be fun besides all these people wouldn't line up and want to do it if it wasn't good. And so, one of the first times in my life where I subjected myself to this faulty logic that just because a lot of people are doing it, it means it's good, I, I um, relented against my better judgment and I got on the zipper world or whatever it was called. And as a mechanical arm like slowly lifted me in the air, we began to spin and the breeze was going through my hair and I could see better the view of the town. I'm like, this isn't so bad. And then it started to get faster and faster and faster and faster. And my poor little 70-pound body is like pinned against the side of the G-force. And I could hear myself screaming, pleading for them to stop the ride. Every time I went by that tattoo carny, I was like begging for him to stop. And he's like, something right, something right, right, right. And I was yelling like this and he didn't stop. I was trapped. And then I got really quiet, because I could feel my mom's spaghetti was looking for a way off the ride too. And I was praying, dear Lord, please no. And the heavens, unfortunately, were silent that day. And so from that day on, my friends renamed this ride. I don't remember what it was called, but I remember what they called it. They named it the Barden Barfatron, because I went and <laughs> dumped, this is a true story, dumped my dinner like some disgusting manner from heaven and all the spectators lined up in the ride. And when I got off the ride and I staggered off and I, I, I realized the main attraction that everybody was lining up for was not life-giving. In fact, it like literally sucked some of the life right out of me. But here's the deal. That's the ride that most of us are on. 
Most of us feel that life just started spinning faster and faster and faster, and the, the, the off switch just broke right off. And we don't know how to slow it down. And we don't know how to do anything differently. We don't know how to get off. We know we don't like it. We know it's not fun. But we don't know how to do different. Well, if you can identify with that metaphor, then Sabbath is the gift that you need to give you the life that you want. For it is the spiritual practice that God has gifted to us to mitigate against the chronic restlessness and frenzy that is our culture so that we can tap into Jesus' rest for our souls. Now, on the most simplest level, the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to stop. In the simplest form, that's what it means. It means to just stop. A day to just stop. Stop from your working. Stop from your spitting. Stop from your striving. Stop from your consuming. So much of life, if we're following Jesus, it's, it's about pursuing God. It's about serving others. And God calls us to a day to just take in and be recharged so that you can, for those other six days, be fully available and fully useful for you to do the things that God has called you to do. And so it's a gift that's bigger than one day. It's a gift that's meant to actually start to shape your whole other six days. And therefore, it was part of Jesus' routine. Jesus himself practiced the Sabbath. Now, imagine it's a hot Saturday in Israel, and Jesus is out with his friends, and you know the sky is blue, and it's beaten down, and his friends, his disciples are walking through this field, and they're getting a little bit hungry, and they start picking some grains there, and they get a handful, and they start rubbing them together, and kind of breaking off the chaff on the outside, and it kind of falls through their hands, and they got, a, they got a little handful of like, you know, a little snack, and they pop it in their mouth. Well, the Pharisees, they see Jesus do this, and they rebuke Jesus. Because that was actually a violation of one of those 39 regulations that they had superimposed on the Sabbath. And Jesus, in response to them, he lovingly rebukes them right back. And he says these amazing words. The Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. This is a stunning line. He says that even though you guys are so fixated on this day, Fixated enough that you came up with all these extra rules and regulations to try to keep the Sabbath. You're actually missing the heart of the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't just another requirement from us. It has been ordained. It has been gifted to us. And so I think the second half of that line, Jesus would emphasize that to those people who are in this you know, guilt-heavy legalistic culture where the Sabbath had become this burden that they had to try to keep day in and day out. It wasn't life-giving, it was just the opposite. Because they were missing God's heart behind it. Now for us today, we don't live in a, you know, we, we don't have a fundamentalist, hyper-religious, ritualistic culture here at Mountainside. And so I don't think Jesus would emphasize the second half of that verse. I think if Jesus were here, he'd emphasize for us the first half. But the Sabbath is God's loving gift to us. That we have missed it or we've ignored it. A.J. Swoboda, he wrote this. He said, the Sabbath has largely been forgotten by the church, which has uncritically mimicked the rhythms of the industrial and success-obsessed West. The result? Our road-weary, exhausted churches have largely failed to integrate Sabbath into their life as vital elements of Christian discipleship. It's not as though we do not love God. We love Him deeply. We just don't know how to sit with God anymore. And then he continued, We have become, perhaps, the most, um, most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, spiritually malnourished people in history. I think Jesus would love to put his hands on all of our shoulders and look us in the eye and say to us, the Sabbath is for you. It's for you. 
God in his love for you thought it up, designed it, and gifted it to you for you to enjoy. Now, right from the very beginning, um, Sabbath was part of the original blueprints that God kind of drew up for your thriving and, and, and our wholeness. It was built into the groove, into the, the rhythm of our DNA. And so the Bible starts like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And after six days of hard work to get the universe up and running, we read the following. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. I'm reading this book right now by a guy named John Mark Comer, and the book is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And so it's kind of this conversation, but way bigger, and so if this is scratching you know, any itch that you might have, come talk to me and I'll give you the title, because I can't recommend uh, the book highly enough. Um, but I love when he starts to answer people's objections in our culture to this whole idea of Sabbath. He always answers their objections with, with two words from here. God rested. Now, Sabbath isn't going to work for me. i got a business to run. It's demanding. There's so much responsibility on my plate right now. God rested. You know, I've got... So little time as it is, and I just can't afford to waste my precious time doing nothing. God rested. We got little kids, and this season of life, it doesn't really fit with Sabbath, so maybe after the kids are older, then we'll consider doing it. God rested. And in so doing, he built into the DNA a rhythm for creation. That you were designed to run on this rhythm, to work for six days and follow that by a day of rest. It's a rhythm that even God himself follows. Now, the first question you should have if, if you're in church or you're not new to church, the first question you should ask yourself if you have any critical thinking ability at all is that why would God need to rest? He's God. Like, he doesn't get tired. He doesn't need to take a nap. Why would God have to rest? Well, understanding that Helps us understanding uh, helps us understand part of what Sabbath is about. Now I said the Hebrew word um, Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which I said means to stop, but it has a secondary meaning. It means to delight in. And so it's a picture of God stopping from all His activity to simply sit back and delight in what He has done. It's almost like a, a musician who sits back and puts on the headphones and just enjoys the song that they recorded. Or a, a, a mom or a dad at the spray park who just sits back on the grass and just enjoys the squeals coming from their kids as they're, as they're running through the fountains. It's a, it's a picture of sitting back and delighting in. God stops and delights in his creation and he tells us to do the same the whole day, to stop and rest to delight in the world, to delight in our place in it, and to delight in the God who is behind it all. Now, I'm just kind of beginning to figure out, for me, what does Sabbath look like? What does that mean to live into that? But it's definitely different than the Sabbath of boredom that my parents' friends, friends' parents enforced on their home. I was telling some folks that the four days between December 26th and December 30th, just you know, a week or so ago, uh, were possibly some of the favorite chunk of time that I've experienced in the last few years. And that's saying lots, because over the last few years, I've had some pretty epic days. I've gone mountain biking in Moab, I've ziplined in Laos, I've built houses in El Salvador, I've got to trek through the jungle in Vietnam. But those days, December 26th to 30th, I think were the best days that I've had in a long while. And I didn't go anywhere super exotic. I was at home. And I didn't do anything super memorable at all. It was just a chunk of time where we together as a family, we stopped. And we just delighted. And it was amazing. It was four days of sleeping in and curling up on the couch and 
with a good book that I was looking forward to reading. It was eating good food. It was taking leisurely walks with my kids. It was playing family board games that weren't super competitive because we've got some family board games that are just not restful at all in our, our home. But it was the, the more restful ones. It was cuddling with my wife. It was having friends over at our house who we were laughing and telling stories. It was all those things that I felt like were tailor-made to both re refresh um, my spirit rest my body and restore my soul. It was, I think, a picture of what Sabbath is supposed to be. And I loved it. I'm beginning to understand what your old pastor Mark Buchanan wrote where he said this, most of the things that we need to be most alive never come out of busyness. They grow and rest. A guy named Dan Aleander, he wrote this seminal work called Sabbath, and in it he says this, the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of our lives. Without question or thought, it is the best day of the week. It is a day that we eagerly anticipate for Sabbath. It is a holy time where we feast, we play, we dance, we have sex, we sing, we pray, we laugh, we tell stories, we read, we paint. Did I say we have sex? Is that what's on there? We walk, we watch creation in all its fullness. Did I mention? Never mind. I mentioned that part. Few people are willing to enter into Sabbath and sanctify it and make it holy because a day of full delight and joy is more than most people can bear in a lifetime, let alone a week. Now, there might be some hyperbole there, but doesn't that sound amazing? Like, doesn't that sound like the total office of religious duty and drudgery? So if that's true, if Sabbath is supposed to be, the, the, you know, the day we look to, forward to most in the week, the best day, the most life-giving day, the question I have is why are we doing it? And if it's so good, why does God need to command it? That's like me ordering my kids to eat chocolate. It is like a, me commanding Matt to go fishing. Like, you shouldn't have to command that. Why does God have to command us to Sabbath if it's so good? Well, I've been thinking about this, and this is what I've come up with. You can see if you agree or not. But I think there's something about the human condition that makes us think that the good things that we want in life, they come to us through ceaseless striving. That the good things that we want come to us through tireless effort and so we have to work harder and harder. And internally, our pride plays on that thinking and externally, our culture and you know, marketing and advertising, they all amplify that same thinking. There is this powerful internal and external force pushing us to go bigger, to go faster, to do more. Everything I know about our culture and about human inclination is that the busyness of life will invade and fill up every waking moment of your life if you let it. It will. Until the adrenal glands burn out, or until your body crashes, or until your health imposes a Sabbath on you, we don't slow down. We're not good at stopping. We're not good at resting and delighting. But that's the way of Jesus. That's what Jesus wants for you. Because life at the fullest is only enjoyed when we honor the finiteness of our being. We're finite creatures with limited time and energy and limited capacity. We are not God. God is the one who can be all things to all people. You can. God is the one who can be at two places at once. I can. God is the one who never needs to sleep or slumber or take a nap. You and I do. Our value isn't determined by just producing endlessly, by doing more and more. Our value is intrinsic into our being. And real rest comes when we realize that God doesn't ask us to be, doesn't ask us to be infinite. Instead, he asks us to rest and delight in him and what he's giving to us in a way that honors the limits of our humanity and worships him as the true infinite one.
Sabbath is about arranging our finite lives around the ultimate rhythm behind the universe. The rhythm between work and rest, between striving and ceasing, between fruitfulness and dormancy, between giving and receiving, between doing and being. All of them have their place. And so God commands that we take an entire day, set it aside to rest and worship, to rest and delight. Now, let me clarify one thing. This is different than just taking a day off. This isn't just your day off from work. Eugene Peterson, uh, the writer, called a day off a bastard Sabbath. It's, it's a poor substitute for a Sabbath because your day off work is a day where you still do all kinds of work. You just don't get paid for it. You've got the list of stuff that you've got to check off and the chores you've got to do. And that is not a Sabbath. A Sabbath is a day set aside to rest and experience worship and delight. And so whatever you do on that day, you should run it through the, the grid and ask, is this a restful thing? Is this something that fills me with delight, that, that recharges my human batteries? Is this something that, that, that inc like turns the inclination of my heart more towards God? If not, then don't do it. The six other days that you can do those things. This one day is for the resting of the body, the refreshing of the spirit, the restoring of your soul. Now, it can be any day of your week. Which is a thing for you mine workers, because it's hard to take a Sabbath while you're driving a whole truck, I know. So it can be any day of your week. Sunday is a good option, it doesn't need to be Sunday. But coming here, gathering to worship, sitting underneath the word, is a good start to your Sabbath. But you know that worship is way bigger than you singing some songs with some other people. Worship is anything that indexes your heart towards God. And so it's going to look different for different people. And that's why there isn't this mandatory, mandatory compulsory list of stuff to do on the Sabbath. There's a lot of freedom to tailor it to your personality, to the way that you wire, to what fills you with delight, what nudges your heart towards God, what gives you rest. For some, that might mean it's a day where you take your nap, where you soak in the hot tub, you play in the park with your kids, you get out on your bike, not to try to crush Strava, but just enjoy the light in being outside. It might be where you meditate on a song, where you go for a prayer walk. It might be stripping that fly on a placid part of the river. It might be opening a good bottle of wine and sinking into a good book. It's, it's gonna look different for different people. For me, it's getting outside, it's walking the dog, it's a family game, it's enjoying a good dinner with my wife, it's laughing and playing. I know some people who, who gardening is like a chore, it's work, and I know other people that mowing the lawn is like therapeutic for them. It's gonna look differently. But you need to pick a day, figure out what works for you, Pick a day, clear off your schedule, turn off your phone. That'd be a really great thing to do for 24 hours. And if you can't imagine doing that for 24 hours, then ask yourself why. It's hard, trust me. I'm trying to do that. I told my family, which I was like, I spoke it out loud. I'm like, I'm turning off on the Sabbath. I'm turning off my phone for 24 hours. And I was like, ah, I wish I didn't say it out loud. <laughs> but I'm just letting you know, I'm trying to do it. It's hard, but it's so important. Give yourself and your family permission to slow down from the speed of life to rest and delight. So it's finally, after all these years of, of following Jesus, it's starting to dawn on me just how essential and non-negotiable this practice is if I want to follow the way of Jesus, if I want to experience the life of Jesus, because this is the only spiritual discipline that makes the Ten Commandments. Bible reading doesn't. Church attendance doesn't. Praying doesn't even make the Ten Commandments. This one does. Because it's so critical and crucial to combat the intrinsic busyness that defines so much of our lives and robs us of the joy and fullness that God wants to bring to you, that God feels the necessity to command us to it. Ultimately, I think the Sabbath is bigger than one day. 
It's bigger than any activity that you choose to do or not do. I think Sabbath actually ultimately brings us back to Jesus and to his cross. Because in a sense, Sabbath isn't the point. It's the path to Jesus. See, if you have a day where you feel permission to stop doing, when you can just simply be, then you are continually reminded that God accepts you because of what Jesus has done. It's a picture of God embracing us, justifying us, not based on your own merit or how hard you work, but on what Jesus has done. And you can rest in that, not just for a day, but you get to rest in that for eternity. And so as you start your new year, as we as a church start a new year where we embrace new rhythms and, and new routines, I'm asking each of you, when will you Sabbath? When is your Sabbath? When will you stop to breathe, to rest, to delight? What day of the week, what one out of seven are you going to set aside to enjoy creation, to enjoy your place in it, and enjoy the God who is behind it all? Hear me, this is by far the most countercultural. Jesus practice that is going to be so hard. So you need to be determined and you need to be disciplined. You need to make a date on your calendar. You need to block it off. You need to turn off your phone so that, you know, the pinging and the emails and the text don't get you right back into the spin mode, which they all do. You need to sit down with your spouse and say, what would it look like for us to have a day to rest and delight and to worship? What fills your soul? What, what helps our family breathe? thrive? What indexes our heart back towards God? God's word, Jesus' action shows us that Sabbath isn't a suggestion. It's how God designed you and I to run. And so I concur with the writer of Hebrews who says this, therefore, while the promise to enter his rest remains, do everything you can to enter it. May you Sabbath well this year. May your soul delight in what God has gifted you with and what God has done in God himself. May you experience rest. Rest for your body. Rest for your spirit. Rest for your soul. Let's pray.